what's going to happen with electric vehicles? What, what, what should we be um, ready for, and how can we be part of this part of this kind of movement? So I think when we started to design the different models at Tesla, Model S, and then Model Three, and then uh, or Model S X uh, Three, and then Y, we wanted to make them really compelling cars because the first answer to that is we wanted them to be really compelling to consumers. And most consumers, when they thought about electric cars pre-Tesla, they thought about a golf cart. That was the comp. So it was short range, really slow, really clunky. And so we thought about like, how would you create a car that was just described by superlatives? It's the fastest, it's the safest, it's the most technically advanced, uh, and, uh, and we started to like design that way. Like what could be a really fun, fun car to own? And so I used to joke with, uh, with people at cocktail parties who were car aficionados. I said, what do you drive? I drive a Ferrari. And we'd say, well, why don't you drive a fast car? Because my little four-door sedan that, suit, that hauls my kids around is actually faster than your Ferrari. Uh, and, um, and so the first step with EVs is to make them compelling. And now there's a lot of compelling EVs. The future, I think you can look to different countries and see what happens when things like the infrastructure bill uh, that just got passed happen here. So in Norway, more than 50% of cars sold are electric. Uh, in the past quarter in Switzerland, more than 50% of cars sold are electric or hybrid. Uh, and when that $12,500 tax credit goes into effect, you're going to see a demand pull that will accelerate us and put us on on par with China, Norway, Switzerland, even Germany, believe it or not, um, has banned ICE cars. Uh, and so it, it made our day, our week, maybe our year, a few years ago when the head of design at Audi publicly said, if you ever drive an electric car, you'll never go back to a combustion car. And it's true, the com consumer experience is awesome. I can't tell you the last time I've been to a gas station. Uh, it just feels great. So COP26. Yeah. What are some takeaways from that? You know, that this, this is something timely. Uh, Gen Z, you know, yeah. you know, are they going to even buy cars, subscription cars? Are they going to, like, what, 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 what's, what's going on in that, that whole uh, dimension of it? So if you look at the, uh, the way the world consumes energy, it basically comes in a really easy framework, thirds. So a third of the world's energy is consumed with transportation, a third heating, cooling, and lighting buildings, and a third in industry. The folks that are, that are working in electric transportation are attacking a third of that energy consumption. Uh, but there's amazing things happening with building technology and with industrial technologies that are a combination of market-based incentives and regulators coming in from, uh, from responsible governments saying, this has to change. What comes out of COP26, I think, are some really big agreements around the use of fuels uh, targets for uh, emissions in agriculture, which is a big deal, uh, and, um, and some really great transportation incentives that other countries around the world are adopting. And quite frankly, COP26 was a little impetus for the U.S. to get this done because they wanted to have that in Biden's hip pocket when he went over. Uh, so he had credibility in terms of what the message he was delivering. What do people not understand about Tesla? You know, you were there for a number of years. What were some of the design decisions that didn't make it in the car that you were overseeing? What are some of the unique things that you guys were doing? Because it wasn't a cookie cutter business. I've been to the original factory that you guys took yeah. over. And uh, is, who is Elon Musk? Is he the Edison of our times? Is he the Tesla of our times? Uh, Nikolai uh, yeah, Tesla? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is he is he a hybrid? Is he like like what what and what was it like? Did he ever sleep on the floor in your office? Like uh, we, what, what was that relationship like? We slept on the factory floor. Uh, we had this really vexing manufacturing problem, and we were trying to solve it. And uh, we're using kind of every technique that we knew of in the book to solve it. And it was just it wouldn't go away. And so we we did spend a few weeks sleeping in conference rooms on the manufacturing floor because we wanted to be there for every shift to see how the problem flowed through the building. And one night we were joking, we were pretty sure that Mary Barra, the CEO of GM, didn't have to sleep on her factory <laughs> floors because they actually know how to manufacture stuff. You asked if, uh, like, is our generation's Tesla or, or Edison? When I went to work with Elon, I thought he was our generation's Edison. And after traveling nonstop together for a few years, I was pretty convinced I was working with our generation's Da Vinci. He's that broad and deep uh, and action-oriented. 
So literally, I'll, I'll describe two days in Hong Kong, one trip. We're jet lagged, we're in the back of a Tesla, that's how we got shuttled around. Uh, and we're both trying to catch up on email uh, over the time difference. And he looks over at me and he says, how fast can you type with your thumbs? I said, like, I don't know, 18, sticks, 18, right? 20, 18, 20 words a minute. He's like, how fast can you type on a keyboard? I'm like, I don't know, 80 words a minute. He said, exactly, we've regressed. The phone has caused our input into the computer to regress. He's like, what if you could think into the computer? Bring com how fast computer would that interface. go? So we start riffing on that in the back of the car. He calls his chief of staff and says, can you get me the leading neural computer interface expert in the world on the phone in the next 12 hours? And they have a deep discussion. And the guy sends paper upon paper to Elon, and he's, he's a voracious reader. He reads for about four hours a day. Starts to devour that stuff. Within a week, Neuralink was started. Day later, we're in Hong Kong for a series of meetings. We're in a tower overlooking Kowloon Bay. And he's, he's, he's an introvert. Uh, he's a really sweet, really humorous guy, but an introvert. And he needed some time after a meeting. So he walked over to a window and asked the team just to let him have his space. And after about 10 minutes, I walked over the window. I said, what are you thinking? And uh, he said, look out the window with me. I look out the window. It's beautiful. He said, did you ever notice that Cities are built in 3D, but the roads are built in 2D. I look out the window and he's like, you know, look at those bridges. Look at the car jam. And you could dig tunnels at different levels in different directions. You could relieve all this traffic and we could actually build cities in 3D and roads in 3D. Turns to his chief staff, this guy was amazing. <laughs> He said, give me the, that Sam Teller? It was Sam Teller yeah, at the time. I know, yeah. And, okay. uh, and says, give me this guy, uh, SpaceX, who's his favorite engineer. And so they get him on the phone. And the poor guy, it's like 2 in the morning, this time, <laughs> which was normal. My wife got really used to the phone ringing at really weird times. And he said, hey, can you find out for me in the next two hours everything you can about tunneling? Yeah. And uh, the guy, in two hours, calls back and says, Tech, tech hasn't changed in 50 years. It tunnels at X rate a minute uh, or per hour. But what I've found is if you dig a hole or if you dig a, if you dig a tunnel, uh, it's a 12 meter tunnel, you, didn't, you don't have to reinforce it. So we could dig tunnels all day long. Elon says, great. Can we buy one of these machines? He's like, yeah, I already found one. They're five million bucks. He's like, great. Buy it. Have it at SpaceX. We'll land there when we get back on Saturday. We'll start digging. Uh, so and, I, I got to be honest, when I first heard about the boring yeah. machine, I thought he just had a bunch of interns in the basement saying, come up with some crazy ideas. I, I, I want to no. put them out there and just show how out there I it's can just, be. It, it's yeah. an example of like, yeah, he looks at the world through a very different yeah. lens, a very special lens. He's just prolific. He, yeah. so, uh, he's, so, so let, me, let me double down on that. So you know, we're at this amazing um, building where when it was built, one of the early announcements was made, we're going to do the subway. Never been yeah, a subway yeah. in North yeah. America. So I purposely programmed you for today because of your Lyft and Tesla experience. We had Vic earlier today yep. who created the, um, the, he's the captain of the MIT team that the made, Hyperloop the, team. That made yep. the Hyperloop. I call it the Model T of Hyperloop. We had the electric plane team, yep. which is yep. going to zero carbon footprint, get organs, you know, fly into places where there's no noise and yeah. health. And then we had the Verijet. Yeah, exactly. They want to disrupt Delta. What, in terms of transportation, what's most interesting to you out there, given that you, know, you were immersed in the Da Vinci thinking guy and you built this car that's done very well? Like, wh where do you think things are going in terms of transportation? What, what are you betting on? What, and where do you, what are some bad paths that you think we should avoid? And wh where would you like to see things go? We just came down a bad path. And that is, we, we, I mean, this isn't terrible for our economy, but it's pretty terrible for our environment. We sold a record number of, new, of cars last year. And the reason is because we all got scared as a community. I, we did, too, in COVID. Everybody said, I'm not going on public transportation anymore. Winnebago's, right? They did well. And, and a car is going to be my personal PPE. So I'm safe in a car. So everybody buys a car. And that has set back a lot of really good trends, maybe for a half a decade. Um, the average car park now is 11 years, 11 and a half years. So it could be longer than that. But things were trending towards carless cities. Mm. And uh, you know, trips under uh, three miles, either on a scooter or a bike that's shared. But I still think that dynamic is, in the near term, going to take place. I mean, Paris just announced $150 million to turn their city streets into bike lanes. 
Uh, and they're going to remove 75,000 parking spaces, which is amazing, uh, to create these uh, protected bike lanes. And, uh, and so I think we're going to see more of a shift towards human-powered, low-impact transportation. But the area of transportation that really excites me is autonomy. No, Rideshare. Uh, like, you know, Uber just surprised people. And rideshare was was part of it. I feel like in the COVID world that kind of evaporated a little bit. Yeah, is that going to come back? I think so. Uh, it's already it's already coming back, but it's going to come back in a different way. Yeah, uh, because people did discover, like in New York or here, uh, city bikes and blue bikes, yeah. uh, and discover that you don't need to take a, a full car uh, for in a in a distance of you know, three to four miles. It's just not necessary. We can go to Cambridge on a blue bike, super easy. Yeah. So. Lululemon, Tesla, similarities, differences, and um, why'd you come back to Boston? Like, you know, you could have stayed out west. You know, Steve Papa talked about, you know, how awesome Boston is. Like, well, you know, I see you as a champion for this region, and, and what are you doing now um, to be relevant and build great companies? And you, you've helped, you know, create a lot of jobs, and a lot of, a lot of uh, value. Uh, what, what, what's next for you? Your first question, Tesla, Lulu, what's in common? Uh, at the heart of both companies is an amazing product. So there's a commitment to an amazing product. And at Tesla, it's a commitment to a perfect product. That's what we are striving for. We don't release perfect on the first release, but we strive for perfect. Lulu, same thing. And amazing fabrics, really um, unbelievable innovation. That's at the core. And then vertically integrated retail is the second thing that's really, it, it's in common between those. So I, sitting on the Lulu board, I got to look at my job at Tesla through a different lens because we're vertic we own our stores and we then therefore have direct contact with our customer, which is an awesome feedback loop, super fast. And the third thing that both had in common that I needed to learn as fast as I could is Tesla's marketing budget is exactly zero. Imagine that, no paid marketing, no SEO, like nothing. And someday we can talk about how that works. And Cult Lulu of personality. Lulu's marketing budget, zero. Wow. Uh, there are no sponsored uh, NBA players or things like that, no. uh, and, uh, and so that's what those things have in common. Why did I come back to Boston? Because I, I feel like this is my roots. I started six companies here. This ecosystem enabled me to do that. Uh, it was the, first the encouragement of my coworkers at Bain and Bain Capital that shoved me out of the nest and said, you can go do this, uh, and I love this market. But I also spend a week a month still in Silicon Valley. Will for the foreseeable future because I'd love to have my feet in both ecosystems because they're very, very different. Right. But we're trying to bring as much of the magic that they have there uh, and deploy it here. In closing, what's one interesting story uh, where you made a difficult uh, call at, at Tesla that might be in, informative? And uh, what, any advice to Gen Z on, on how to you know, be like you? Oh, I don't know, but don't, don't aim that low, aim higher. Um, I think, so a difficult call, right when I, Right when I got to Tesla, I was learning the business. I hadn't been in the car manufacturing business. And uh, the, four, the five or six people that are responsible for the company, uh, we meet with Elon for a few hours every Wednesday. And the guy that ran manufacturing was one of the most talented people I'd worked with. And he came into one of my first management meetings. He came in and he was ashen-faced. And he said, um, I got some really bad news. We uh, misassembled the seat belt for the driver's seat. And I think there could be some cars out there that the seat belt is not connected to the car. Like we missed the bolt. And uh, he's like, John, it's a big problem for you because your service people are going to have to fix all these things. And you're going to have to recall them. We're going to figure this out. Uh, what do we do? And to a person in that room, the easy call that is made in most car manufacturing situations is let's just let this play out. Let's see how many cars are affected. We don't know. Let's take our time. Which had been done at Ford and GM, GM's uh, fires and Ford's rollovers. And, we were, and to a person in that room, they said almost the same thing. Like if my mom's in that car, I'm doing something about this today. So they said, in the next five minutes, we're calling NHTSA, we're recalling. And it wasn't even a thought to delay. Uh, we didn't know how big the problem was. Those things can tank a stock price. And, uh, and that was a, a tough call that that team made look easy. 
And uh, I, I was only a, a month or two in, I was like, I think I'm really gonna like working with these people. <laughs> any, any advice uh, for Gen Z? I would say like the common trait of somebody that I think does really well at a Tesla or a Lulu or uh, an Apple or Google or wherever is to be, is to continually push yourself to be at the top of your game. Like j just to bring an A game to your marketplace, whether that's an academic marketplace, a medical marketplace, a nonprofit marketplace, to be world class. Mm -hmm. And to get hired at Tesla, you had to get through a final interview with either Elon or me. We interviewed everybody, manager and above, in a 40,000 person company, largely to preserve two things culture. We wanted to test the th that they fit the culture. But the real test was we wanted evidence that they were world class. Yeah. So uh, Apple, I think, got to 4% of the uh, computer market, changed the graphic interface you know, vector. Is Tesla just going to be 1% or are they going to get 50% and or have major market share? What's your prediction? They're going to be more than 1% market share, but, uh, but the percentage of EVs that are sold, EVs are only 4% of cars sold today worldwide. So you know what's happening. I mean, cars are, are uh, combustion cars are going to be banned in anywhere from 2025 to 2050, depending on which jurisdiction. Uh, you're talking about. So even in Germany, the home of the ice car, by 2030, no more in, in, ice cars are internal combustion engine cars. So no more ice cars. So you know that electric vehicles by 2030 are probably going to be 50% of the market. So that means it's going to go from 4% to 50%. You can do the math. That's a 12x plus. And so even if Tesla has the same market share, they're going to grow by 12 times. Yeah. Mazel tov. <laughs> Thank you, John McNeil. All right.